Good morning to everybody. Glad to have you all here. Um, glad, as Matt has said already, uh, to be here and to be worshiping with you all this morning. Uh, we serve an awesome God, one who is alive, as we just sang. And so um, it is such a joy to be here and to, to worship, to praise with all of you. Today is a special day for our church because tonight begins our life groups back up. Uh, so here at Central, we are very big on life groups. If you're unfamiliar with what these are, uh, this is an opportunity that we want to encourage everybody uh, to take advantage of for you to join in with several families from throughout the church. Uh, and each Sunday night, you'll be meeting together. Um, you'll be spending some time in the Word of God. There will be some times where you'll serve. You'll do some uh, service projects and reach out into the community with your group. But the whole idea is for you to form meaningful, deep and lasting relationships. Studies show that you need, in order to flourish fully in your faith, you need five connections with other people of spiritual influence. Five relationships, five different relationships that you need to have in order to fully keep yourself strengthened, to keep yourself encouraged. So if you're sitting here this morning and you can't think of who those five people are, there's no better way to find these people. There's no better way to force yourself into some situations where you're opening up, engaging with people uh, than to take part in one of our life groups. And if you're someone who says, I got my five, I know exactly who my five people are, I've got 20 of them, then chances are you are a really good person for someone else to connect to. And so you need to join into these uh, so that you can be an encouragement to others. David will come up here uh, before we close today and he'll give us a little bit more of some details of how you can get signed up for these if you've not been in a life group before, how you can begin participating in that. So just want to give a quick plug for that. It's a very, very important thing. We can't encourage strongly enough uh, this church to take part in these life groups. There's a story about a businessman and he was flying to Chicago for a work trip. And this guy flies every single week. It's nothing new for him to get on a plane. It is part of his routine. He can't count the number of flights that he's been on. So when this man steps onto a plane, there is nothing nervous or anxious inside him. And so he recalls this one particular flight. He says he gets on the flight and it was everything is normal. The takeoff was normal, just par for the course as usual. And as they're flying through the air, they've about 10, 15 minutes up and they finally hit their altitude, and the pilot comes on, the captain comes on, he says, this is your captain speaking. We're gonna ask that everybody remain in their seats, and you keep your seat belts fastened. He said, we're expecting a storm up ahead, and there could create a little bit of turbulence. And so if you could all just stay in your seats, everything will be fine. Captain goes off, and so the man thinks, I've heard this a 100 times, you know, fine, we're, we're gonna hit a little bit of turbulence. And he continues on, he's not anxious, he's just ready for his flight to be over. About 10, 15 more minutes goes by, and the plane begins to shake just a little bit. Captain comes on, and he says, this is your captain speaking, because of the turbulence that we're headed towards, we're gonna go ahead and cancel all of our in-flight drink services, so our stewardess aren't gonna be making their way up and down. If everyone could please stay in their seats, keep their seatbelts fastened, he thinks, okay, well, we might be in for a little bit of a, a storm here. Another few minutes goes by, the plane begins to shake and rock even more violently than before, and the man thinks, okay, I've not quite felt anything like this before. The captain comes on and says, due to the turbulence, due to the storm that's up ahead of us, we're gonna go ahead and cancel our in-flight meal. We wanna make sure everyone stays safe, so if you could, Everybody will be fine if you stay in your seats and keep your seatbelt fastened. Well, not shortly after that message, he says the whole plane just begins to shake and then the thunder hits. And he can look outside the window and he can see that they are right in the middle of a lightning storm. And the man recalls of all the flights that he's been on, this was one of the scarier things that he's seen outside the window, but yet again, the pilot comes on and he says, folks, we're heading through just a little bit of a thunderstorm here. We travel through these things through these things from time to time. It's nothing to worry about if everyone could just remain calm, stay in your seats with your seat belts fastened. Well, the man says that as he's looking around, people begin to chatter and talk about what's really going on. No one quite trusts the captain. Oh, he doesn't want us to know. Are we gonna be okay? Are we safe? And so the chatter begins to spread all throughout the cabin. Well, finally, they are going through some major turbulence. 
And he says the plane begins to just go up and down. He describes it like a cork out in the ocean. It's just going up and down and up and down, and things are banging in the overhead compartments, and some things are falling out into the aisle. And he says at this moment, everybody begins to go into full-blown panic. There's ladies who are crying. There's men who are praying. And he says this one little girl catches his attention. He's been looking at her throughout the whole flight. And as people are slowly beginning to grip their armrests all the way up to this final moment where everyone is panicking and they're crying and they're praying, he's been paying attention to this little girl. And he says she sat in her seat. She was all alone, sitting by herself. And he said she was perfectly calm. When everyone else is panicking, when everyone else is scared and worried, she is the picture of calmness. He said she sat there reading a book. And before that pilot comes on to give his last word of encouragement that things are okay, he said he finally looks at her and she's closed her eyes and she's slightly gripping the seat. And everyone else is in full-blown panic and the pilot comes on and he says, folks, if we could just hang on, we'll be through this in a moment. Stay in your seats, remain calm, and keep your seatbelt fastened. And the man says he looks at the little girl and she releases her grip from the seats. She opens her eyes after the pilot has given this warning, and she pulls her book out and calmly again begins to read. So finally the plane lands, and they make it safely, and everybody is cheering, and they're hooraying, and they're wiping the sweat from their brow. And the man said, I was so fascinated by the peace and the calmness that I saw in this little girl. And so he rushes, and he gets all of his things together, and he races through the terminal, and he he, he catches up to her, and he says, hey, excuse me, little girl, I'm just curious. I was watching you when we were going through that turbulence. I was watching you as the plane was shaking, as everybody was praying, and as everybody was crying, and I noticed how calm you were. And I have to know, what in the world made you so brave? The man says that the little girl looks back at him, and she says, well, that pilot that kept coming on the intercom, that was my daddy. And he told me everything was going to be fine, and we're going to make our way home. We're a whole lot more likely to trust when we know who's driving the thing, aren't we? We're a whole lot more likely to trust and to find peace in the middle of anxious times when we know the one who is driving. In the middle of our life's turbulence, who is it or what is it that we're trusting? See, like that plane, there's things in our life. We're we're calling this suit up, standing firm in a shaky world. There are some things that we're going to encounter and engage in our lives that will absolutely shake us to the core. There's some things that will send our whole world upside down. And many of you have walked through these things and you know what I'm talking about. But just for some examples, these are the type of conversations that begin to shake us. This is what life turbulence looks like. When your boss calls you in and says, I hate to tell you this. We're going to be having to let some people go. Or maybe it's when that doctor calls you and says, I didn't want to tell you this. I hate to make this call, but the cancer is spreading. Maybe it's a spouse who sits you down and says, I'm sorry, but I just don't love you anymore. These are real situations. This is real life turbulence. These are the kind of things that when hit, If we don't know what we're firmly trusting in, if we don't have something firm to grasp onto, these are the kind of things that completely upend our lives. We're living in a world that is filled with turbulence. I believe what we're gonna see Paul detailing and talking about is that we're living in a world with an enemy, with an opposition, who is throwing things at us in hopes that we will be upended from the ways of God. What is it that we're trusting? When we go through life's turbulence, we trust the one who is driving. Let's look in Ephesians chapter six. If you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter six. This is where we've been for the past uh, two weeks here. This is where Paul is gonna detail this armor of God. So things that we know up to this point is Paul has been walking through this letter to the Ephesians and as we've said so many times, he gives them an identity, doesn't he? He tells them this is who you are, you are children, of the Father. You were bought and paid for by Christ and you are people of the promise. You're promised the inheritance of the Father. But then he closes out this whole letter with talking about some ways that we protect ourselves. And so what we've learned so far is we're talking about protecting ourselves from the enemy. 
In chapter six, he begins by talking about that we're not fighting a fight against flesh and blood. We're not fighting a fight against people. We're engaged in a battle. We're engaged in a war against the forces of evil, against what he says the devil's schemes. Satan is scheming. He's trying to do everything he can to upend our lives. And so what Paul details is he paints this beautiful picture of what it looks like to put on an armor that defends ourselves from the things that Satan will throw at us to knock us off course. And he uses this idea of a Roman soldier's armor because it's a, it's a perfect example for him. He's on house arrest. He's looking at one of these soldiers. But let's read this together. This is verses 13 through 16 of chapter 6. He says, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. If you remember from two weeks ago, we talked about how important it is to wrap ourselves up in the truth of God. To wrap ourselves up in the promises of God because what we understand about the enemy, what we understand about Satan is that he is what? He's a liar. He's a deceiver. Jesus says in John that that's his native language. That's, that's his speech. He, he can't say anything without lying. And so if we're up against an enemy who is constantly lying to us, who is constantly deceiving us, it's so important that we are rooted in truth. And so Paul says, wrap yourselves up in truth. Then with the breastplate of righteousness in place, last week we talked about how important it is for you and I to take on righteousness but not only to take, not just to take on our righteousness, we're not talking about being self-righteous, doing the things we can do to make ourselves right, to make ourselves whole, to make ourselves per perfect. No, we take on what the gospel so beautifully describes. We're taking on the righteousness of God because he is perfect. Through our faith in him, through our trust in him, we take on his righteousness. We are made right, we're justified through him. And so we continue, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from this gospel of peace. And here's where we'll be today. In addition to all of this, I love the way that language signifies that this is something important, right? If Natalie tells me to go to the grocery store, she might list, okay, you need to get eggs, you need to get milk, you need to get bread, you need to get, uh, you know, baby food, all this. But in addition to all of this, Adam, above all of other, all these other things, make sure you get diapers, I'm gonna walk through that store and nine times out of 10, I'm forgetting something off of that list. But if she says it the way that Paul says it, okay, in addition to everything, Adam, in, in, in overall, all the other things I told you to get, don't forget to get diapers, then I'm gonna get those things. And here's what Paul says. In addition to all of this, in addition to the, the feet of readiness, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, he says, above all of this, or, or better yet, the translation would probably be, covering all of this, over all of this, place the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Paul tells us to take up a shield. It's the quintessential piece of armor when you're trying to defend yourself from something. This is what a Roman soldier's shield would have looked like. So sometimes when we think about shields, we, I think about a Initially, I think about Captain America, right? He's got that round shield. That's his weapon of choice. And it's something that just sort of covers up your arm right here. That's not the kind of shield that a Roman soldier's shield would have looked like. This thing looks more like a door, and the dimensions are pretty similar to it. It's just basically a big, massive rectangle. They're said to be anywhere from four to five feet tall and about two and a half to three feet wide. And it was a solid piece of thick wood. You can see at the bottom and at the top here, what they would do is they would dip the tops and the bottoms of this solid piece of wood in some sort of hard metal, iron or bronze, something to fortify it, something to strengthen it. And so they've got this big door-shaped thing and on the inside there would be some sort of handle and there would be a strap so that they could put it on their back when they're traveling. And this massive piece of wood would then be wrapped up in leather and that leather would oftentimes, when they're going into battle, be soaked in water. This is a heavy piece of armor, isn't it? It would be soaked in water so that as the enemy archers are shooting flaming arrows at them, when it hits their shield, it extinguishes them. What Scripture says, what Paul says, is it quenches them, it puts them out. And so they've got this shield, and so we understand sort of what this shield, what this piece of armor looks like. And the virtue that Paul connects to this is what? Faith. He says, your shield is to be faith. Your shield is to be faith. The thing that protects you, the thing that covers every other piece of your armor, 
the thing that you do not go into battle without is your faith. No one went into battle without their shield. You had to go into battle without your shield. To the Spartans, the shield was this thing of honor. There was a thing that Spartan mothers would say as their sons were going off to war. They would say, be sure that you come back with your shield or else upon it. Basically to say, if you lose your shield, you're going to come back on top of it because you can't survive out in the war without it. You have to have your shield. Paul says you have to have your faith. So what is this faith that Paul's talking about that becomes this great defense mechanism for us in our battle with the evil one? So faith is one of these words that's a little bit difficult to understand and, and to sort of determine what are they talking about. Last week we talked about righteousness. If you remember, sometimes righteousness can sort of become this general term that's used for so many different things that we kind of just forget, well, what does it really even mean? And faith is sort of the same way. We're not strangers to this word. We've heard the word before. We hear it a lot in church. We read it a lot in scripture. What exactly does faith look like? What is a good description of faith? So here's the word that Paul uses. This is a Greek word uh, that he uses for faith. It's the same word that Jesus uses for faith. It's called pistis, all right? <clears throat> My North Alabama is probably butchering the pronunciation here, okay? But the translation is what all we really care about. Here's this word for faith. It means to be persuaded or to come into trust. To be persuaded of something or to come to trust. A better, a better definition, I think, for our terms would simply be this. If you want a simple definition of faith, it's this. It's belief and it's trust. Belief and trust. Sadly, sometimes our definition of faith sort of gets pigeonholed just right here. It's just believing in something. I have faith that, that simply means that I believe. Remember what James says in James chapter two. He says, you, you just believe? Your faith is just made up of belief? He says, even the demons believe in that there is only one God, and they shudder at him. He says, no, show me your faith. Show me your belief by your actions, by the things that you do. It's not just a belief. I think it's a belief that pushes us to something else. It's a belief that pushes us to trust because I believe in Jesus because I believe in the Father, because I believe in his word and his commands, it drives me to something. Hebrews chapter 11. Go ahead and turn there with me. We're gonna be there for just a moment. Hebrews chapter 11 is sort of known as like the chapter on faith. But there's a great definition of faith that we see in verse 11. Or excuse me, chapter 11, verse one. Hebrews chapter 11, verse one says this. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. He says, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Now, I think wrongfully so, sometimes this passage has been used to give us this definition that faith is believing in something that I don't see. And, and that's a, a fair enough definition, I guess, but I was listening to some podcasts this week and there was this excellent one where there was a, a Christian scholar and an atheist scholar and they were debating what is the proper definition of faith. And, and the atheist scholar, he comes in locked and loaded, ready to say, okay, you believe that you know, faith is simply believing in things that can't be proven. Believing in things that you just can't find any, any evidence for. And the Christian scholar was, stood his ground. He says, no, that's, that's a poor definition of faith. Because if you're truly a believer, then you understand that there's plenty of evidence for Jesus. There's plenty of historical evidence of Jesus. There's plenty of historical evidence of his crucifixion. Jesus was a real person. He walked this earth. But he says even more so, what we find is this, that the teachings of Jesus and the word of God, scripture, proves itself to be true when lived. Do you get that? The word of God, the Bible, proves itself to be true when its teachings are lived out. And so this Christian scholar says, as I've been walking with Jesus, he has proven himself in real ways over and over and over. As I'm living out the teachings of scripture, it has proven itself to be true. It has proven itself to be good. And so I'm not believing in things that there is no evidence or proof for. He says, every day I see evidence. 
He says, a better definition for me would be this. I believe, and it's pushing me towards something. It pushes me towards trust, towards a relentless trust, towards putting all of my hope, putting all of, all of casting all of my anxieties in the one whom I believe in. There is this reckless trust in the Lord. I think that's a good description of faith. And so what is Paul talking about? Okay, your, your, your shield that's gonna protect you in battle is your trust in who God is. Why, why is this so important? Because we're facing an enemy who is hurling everything he can at us, I believe, to cause us to doubt. To cause us to doubt, to cause us to begin to wonder, is this really the way to go? Is this stuff really true? Can this really be? And he is hurling everything he can. Paul says he is firing flaming arrows at you. So guard yourself. Protect yourself with your faith, with your deep-rooted, relentless trust that he is good, that he is powerful, that he is God. And so let's take a look at just three things I think we can understand about what a faith that protects us from the evil one, a faith that shields us from the evil one, does for us in our life. The first thing is this. A true faith, a good faith, one that's rooted in belief in who he is, is one that moves us forward. So the shields of Roman soldiers, that they were mainly meant for one thing, at least this type of shield, and that was advancing in on the enemy. So if you can imagine they're approaching this, ca this castle or they're approaching some sort of city wall, and as they're going to sort of siege this city, as they get closer and closer and closer, the attacks get more and more dangerous and real. And so there was a formation that these soldiers would take. It was literally called the tortoise. They would make this massive shell over their whole unit, and so everyone would either hold their shield up or they would hold their shield in front, and they make sort of this tortoise shell. And what happens is they're approaching this city gate. The soldiers would begin to form all across the top of the city gate. And they begin to fire arrows as the enemy got closer and closer. And with your shields in place held above your head or in front of you, you form this, sh this sort of shelter. And they would slowly but consistently move closer and closer and closer to their goal, which is to siege the city. And it's even said that after they would be shooting the arrows, when they got close enough to the city... Any approaching enemy when they got close to the city, now citizens and soldiers alike would line the city walls and they would begin to throw everything they could to try and knock the incoming enemy off course. It's said that they would throw stones, they would push boulders, they would throw logs, they would even take big iron pots and they would chunk them over the city gates in hopes that they could knock the incoming enemy off course. But with their shields in place, Roman soldiers were impenetrable and they would just continue to steadily move forward, advancing towards the goal. I think that's what a strong trust in the Lord does for us in our lives. Because we know that there's things that we're supposed to be doing. We know that there's things, if we're wanting to be obedient followers of Jesus, there's things that he calls us to do. And I believe that Satan is standing at the top of the, at the, top of the gates and he is pushing everything at us to try and keep us from advancing closer and closer and closer to the will of the Father. I believe he's trying to throw everything he can at us to keep us from coming closer and closer and closer to our kingdom mission. And so strong trust, I believe, fortifies us, protects us, and keeps us moving forward. If you're still in Hebrews chapter 11, I want to point out a couple of things that we see. So this starts what's sort of jokingly called the Hall of Fame of Faith. The writer here is gonna go through and he's gonna talk about the different faiths of people that we see all throughout scripture. But we're gonna just look at a, a couple. This is verse seven of Hebrews chapter 11. I want you to look at what Noah does here and ask yourself, where is the trust? What is the trust of Noah doing? Verse seven, he says, by faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of this righteousness that is keeping, in keeping with faith. So we have the story of Noah, and we know about Noah, right? God has given Noah this command. God has given Noah this word to say that there's a flood coming. 
And Noah, I am calling you to build this ark, to build this ship so that you and your family can be spared. Noah, the only righteous one left in the world. And God gives him this word. How confusing of a message this must have been for Noah. A flood? Never seen anything like this. The dimensions of the ark, some of you guys have been up to, to Kentucky there and you've seen sort of what this thing would have looked like. This is a massive undertaking that he's calling Noah to. And it must have sounded absurd. But what Noah does is this. I believe the trust that Noah has in the word of God has, is pushing Noah forward, is pushing Noah towards obedience to God. It's his faith and his trust in that what God says he is doing, he will do. And it pushes him towards obedience. The question that we have to ask ourselves is this when we look at Noah. Is there something in my life that just doesn't make sense to me? Is there something that this Christian life is calling me towards that I say, you know what, this just doesn't make sense. This is too hard. This is too difficult. Is this really what I need to do? What is it that our trust in the word of God is preventing us from doing? Is our trust pushing us towards obedience? Continue on, he talks about Abraham. Verse eight, it says, by faith when Abraham called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, he obeyed and he went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents and he did as did Isaac and Jacob who were heirs with him in the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with the foundations whose architect and builder is God. The writer recalls the time when Abraham was told to leave and to go and to step out into the unknown. He says he steps into a foreign land. He doesn't even know where he's going. He's simply following the word of God. What trust do you see in Abraham here? What faith do you see in Abraham? This isn't a faith that simply says, I believe. This is a faith that is manifested in actions. This is a faith, that, a faith that's trust is pushing it to go towards the will of God. And he steps out into the unknown. And he sacrifices comforts. And he lives as a foreigner in a strange land. Why? Because God commanded him to. What faith, what trust in the word of God. So the question that we ask ourselves about our own trust, our own shield of faith is this. Do I have a trust so firm that I'm willing to step out into the unknown to follow God's commands? What is it today that we feel like God is calling us to that we say, it's just too scary. I just don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I'm strong enough to do that. What is he calling you to that your trust is preventing you from obeying? Lastly, he says this, verse 11, and by faith, Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was unable to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. The writer recalls that Sarah was in her 90s when the Lord said that you're gonna conceive a child. And though at first she laughs it off and she thinks, how in the world could this be? There was a trust that Sarah has and, and what scripture says is that she trusted in the trustworthiness of the Lord. What is it in your life that seems impossible that you're refusing to trust the Lord in? Remember what Ephesians 3, chapter, 20, or chapter 3, verse 20 says, that he is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. What is the impossible thing? What is the outlandish thing? What is the thing that just doesn't seem as though that, that couldn't really happen? What is the impossible thing that we're refusing to trust the Lord in? Do you see how trust, do you see how faith continues to move us forward? When I trust fully, I become much more obedient. When I trust in the direction of the Lord, I become much more obedient to following his voice. Lastly, Hebrews chapter 12, I think, gives an excellent idea of what it looks like to be charging forward. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Let us cast off everything. 
Let us guard ourselves up with our trust in the word of God and let us relentlessly push towards his will. No matter what Satan tries to entangle us with, no matter how he tries to throw us off course, let us charge full speed ahead towards the Lord. The next thing is this. A solid faith is a singular faith. One of the things that's most important about the construction of this shield is that it's a solid piece of wood. If you could imagine a, a shield that's made up of several pieces of wood and somehow they're, they're glued together, they're nailed together, well, that thing's not very strong, is it? But a, a shield that's solid, a shield that's one solid piece of wood provides great protection against anything that comes its way. The same thing is true for you and I when we're talking about our trust. What is it that I'm fully trusting in my life? Is it solely the Lord? Or is it a little bit of the Lord and a little bit of myself and a little bit of other people? What trusting voice am I listening to? Israel has this terrible reputation as you read throughout the Old Testament of being people who just give their trust to to things willy-nilly. And we see it as, as it goes through and God is trying to train them to put all of their trust in him. What does he do when he leads them out of Egypt? He walks them right up to a dead end something that they cannot pass through. He's forcing them to trust that he will take care as he splits the water. And as they're wandering through the desert and their stomachs begin to growl and they cry out to God for food, what is it that God does when he sends the manna? He says, take what you need for the day. Anything over that will spoil. God is forcing them to trust that every single morning when I wake up, Lord, you will provide. God is trying, as he's called Israel out to be his own, his own elected people, God is trying to foster in them this faith, this belief, this understanding, this trust that I am your protector. I am your provider. But where you and I get so thrown off course is trying to think that my job is to be my own provider. My job is to be my own protector. And I put all of my trust on the greatest temptations I face is to put way more of my trust in myself and in my own abilities, and in my own abilities to take care of myself, and my own abilities to know what is right, to know which direction to go than placing all of my trust in the Lord. And a trust that's made up of several different things is a trust that is weak. Psalm 115, we read it this morning. I wanna read it to you again, just this part. To Israel, he says, verse nine, all you Israelites trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. House of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. You who fear him, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. I love the threefold warning here. Trust in him, Israel. He is your help. He is your shield, your protector. I see the psalmist doing something that I desire to to believe and to trust in my own life and desire for us as a church. How many times do we have to say it? Put all of your trust in him. Put all of your trust in him to be your protector. He will provide. He will take care. Stop trying to do this on your own. Where is our trust? Where is our faith? Is it in ourselves? Is it in someone else? Is it in the voices that we hear in the world or is it in the voice that is calling us in the Father? And then the last thing is this. I think we have to have a healthy understanding and recognition that faith doesn't avoid the blows, it simply absorbs them. Doesn't avoid the blows, it simply avoids them. This is from Charles Spurgeon, a quote from a sermon that he preached in 1861. It says, many Christians believe that after finding the Savior, they're gonna ride off softly to heaven, singing all the way. I read that quote and I thought, okay, why is Spurgeon picking on young Christians? Many young Christians, after they find the Savior, after they understand and after they put their faith in the Lord, they think they're just gonna ride off to heaven, singing all the way. Everything's gonna be roses. There will be no troubles. There will be no tribulations. There will be no struggles. Nothing will knock me off course. I'll be fine. I'm in the Lord now. I think Spurgeon picks on the young Christian because he understands that no mature Christian still thinks that way because they've lived life. And as we talked about when we opened up, when you live life, you understand that life's blows just don't seem to stop. Just because we're following Jesus, 
just because we're people of faith, just because we're people who are trusting Jesus, the, the, the difficulties of life don't stop. In fact, sometimes it seems like a more amplified version of them just rains down on us. Why is that? Spurgeon continues, he says, why would scripture tell us to, to suit up if there were no battle to be fought? Life's blows, life's difficulties, the pain of life doesn't stop when following Jesus. What Paul is not saying is that if you suit yourself up with this shield of faith, if you have a strong trust and belief in the Lord, then all of life's difficulties will cease. No, what he's saying is this, you'll guard yourself with something that's strong enough to absorb them. Strong enough to help you endure them as we continue to move forward, as we continue to move towards him, things will continue to happen. Listen to what Jesus says. This is John 16, 33. I love how real Jesus is with his disciples. He says, a time is coming, verse 32. In fact, there's already come when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. Verse 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you'll have trouble. Take heart, I have overcome the world. In this world, you have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. For many of you this morning, when you read those words from Jesus, you say, I get it. This world will have trouble. I get it, I've lived it. I've walked through it with my family. I'm walking through it with my family right now. May we take comfort. May we guard ourselves with the truth. May we trust fully and relentlessly in the words that Jesus says. He says, but take heart. I have overcome the world. There's a trust in the hope of the promises. Remember what Hebrews 11.1 1 says. Assurance in the things that we have. Assurance in the promises of God. Take heart. I have overcome the world. Our trust isn't gonna stop life's difficulties, but it will provide some isolation from them. Who is it that we're trusting? What is it that we're trusting? The last thing is we understand how important this trust is, is this last sort of snippet from what Paul says. He says, in addition to all of these things, above all of these things, take up the shield of faith. Take up a trust that is strong enough to keep you moving towards him. Take up a trust that is solely rooted in him and in nothing else. Take up a trust, not that avoids the blows of life, but one that is strong enough to handle them. This morning, if there's anyone in here who has yet to take up a trust in Jesus, then the painful reality of it is this, like that Spartan mother, she says, don't go out into battle without your shield. We're walking around in a battlefield. Satan is hurling everything he can at us, trying to upend our worlds, trying to throw us off course, trying to pierce us with the flaming darts of sin, of temptation, of doubt. If your faith isn't strongly rooted in a belief and a trust in Christ Jesus, then we're wandering around the battlefield without a shield. This morning, if there's anyone who is ready to take up their shield, to begin trusting in Jesus, then please come forward as we stand together, as we sing.